So I tend to use a Q&A style and I just want to make sure that, uh, that your questions get answered. Um, I also want to make sure that I put out there at the beginning, whether you are in your first year, whether you are you know, uh, about to apply, if you want feedback early on, we are happy to, to chat with you. Um, we do prospective appointments from March to September every year. So in your first year, for the most part, it's keep doing what you're doing, hopefully. Um, or if there was one grade that kind of got away from you, we go, OK, let's keep an eye on it. But right now, you know, probably don't have to repeat it. Um, if you are in your second or third year, maybe a little bit more emphasis on where your experience looks at this point and what trajectory you're on, how things are going academically for you. They're getting, you know, they're starting to cement, but aren't quite um, in a place where this is your GPA when applying. Um, those that talk to me before they apply, hopefully we do so a little bit earlier on in the year, like March rather than September, because then realistically there's just more you can do. Um, and certainly then we can talk about things like letters of evaluation, essays, um, GRE scores, stuff like that, where we can just kind of get a sense of overall how competitive are you going to be and in a short amount of time how can you make the biggest impact in your application. Um, for those of you that said that you were from Massachusetts, good news, we're 30% Massachusetts, it gives you an advantage. Um, that school's kind of hard to get into. Um, the stat is pretty much there's one seat for every two people that want that seat. Uh, so, if we can give you feedback as you go, it's great. If you have an advantage somewhere, it always makes sense to, uh, to apply to that school. How many of you that aren't from Massachusetts have a veterinary school in your state? Terrific, so at least you have advantage there too. And the good news for everyone else then, um, for all the out-of-staters is 70% out of state is going to be huge when you compare it to the other veterinary schools. Um, so hopefully there are things I can tell you about today that I can continue to tell you about, put you in contact with people that could be good resources, things that you've already heard about our program that make it appealing for you. Um, strategically, Tufts is a really good school to apply to as well because it's going to be one of your better options with that 70% out of state. So, that being said, why don't you give me an idea of some of those topics that you hope we, we cover and we'll just make sure we get there. Questions, topics, um, sometimes I'm going to be, you know, I'm happy to be a representative of applying to veterinary school in general. I'm happy to tell you more about Tufts specifically. Um, and then beyond the admissions process, if you just want to know more about our individual programs or opportunities available to our students, um, I'm happy and I love, you know, the stats are important but also just the student experience or different opportunities or ways that you can get more involved um, are really fun to talk about as well. I have two things. Mm -hmm. um, one being, if you um, are, have had multiple internships um, throughout uh, high school and like summer college internships, does that like increase your chance of getting into veterinary school or does it really not do anything? or? I think that, and what's the other one? Just so I, I'll make sure we go. I want to know about your large animal program. Yeah, sure. Okay. See why you separated it out? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, one of the bigger topics as far as preparing for veterinary school is gaining experience. Um, how many of you know that the DBM is what you want to do? How many of you like science? You like medicine? And you go, maybe there's interesting ways to integrate that um, with animals, great. Or, um, you know, either are still on the fence and the DVM still might be what you want to do, but maybe you want to go into uh, human medicine. Experience um, will give you, first of all, it's going to help your application, but secondly, it also is going to allow you personally to make a choice of what do I think the right steps are for me? Um, what do I love about this? What's going to be really difficult about this? Is it worth the difference in pay, realistically? Um, do I need to be a veterinarian to make the kind of impact that I want to make? You know, if at the end of this talk I say, hey, you don't have to be a vet to do that, um, and I can save you the four years of stress, money, hard work, you know, that goes into veterinary school, um, that's important too. <laughs> um, so for instance, we have some master's programs, conservation medicine, 
um, infectious disease and global health, and animals and public policy, all of them will allow you to make a positive contribution with animals. At the least, you guys probably like animals. You're not monsters, so, you know, then there's the just, from there, do I want to make a career out of this, and if so, what credentials do I need, or what aspects are most appealing. Doing things like internships are going to give you an idea of what do I really like about it, what's going to be challenging, and is this worth it. Um, the more conversations you're exposed to, the better. The more responsibilities you hold, the better. Again, both for you personally, but also for your application. Um, so absolutely, we're going to look to see what kind of experience do you have. Whether it's titled an internship or not doesn't matter so much. But what does definitely matter is what you're doing during it. Yeah. Um, I was looking at requirements of like different vet schools, and they say like to have 250 hours experience under a vet. Is that like a requirement across most vet schools, or is that just some of them? Or? So the best advice I can give you is if you're serious about applying to veterinary school or you're even exploring it, um, get an idea of what the minimums are at the schools that you're most interested. Um, because there is not a overreaching theme of you need 500 hours of this or this many with a vet, some differentiate whether it's with a vet, if it's veterinary, you know. We just joined the common application called VEMCAS. It's the first time ever where something's being divided for us between research, animal related, vet experience. If you were to ask me what is this one, how do I categorize it, I would have no idea. Um, we're going to look at you just very holistically and just see that you have enough of something. So the answer in general is absolutely log every hour. Um, make sure that you are meeting the minimums at the schools that you are most competitive for, the ones that are the best match for you geographically, financially, professionally, you know, the schools that are your top choices. Um, because if you don't match up with your 15th top you know, number school, who cares? You know? um, for Tufts, we don't have any sort of minimums. Um, how many of you are bio majors? How many of you are just in non-traditional majors? Things like English, social science, uh, type majors. All right, so that might be a little bit easier for you. But we're not going to penalize anyone for deciding later on that maybe veterinary medicine is what they want to do. Um, we're also not going to say, why don't you have something? We'll pay attention to what you have and the extent to which you have it. It's going to be a lot easier for someone at UMass Amherst, Rutgers, UConn, to have far minimal experience than you guys coming today. Just look around. Um, but if you have it, great. You're not going to be penalized for not having it. If the depth of your experience comes in research, terrific. Um, look to supplement it with some other areas. So whatever you can get as the most involved in, the better. Um, the more responsibilities, the better. A progression of those responsibilities is great. But if someone says to me, I have a thousand hours of small animal, and someone else says they have 500, it doesn't tell me what you're doing. So we would prefer the 500 if it means you're doing restraint, blood draws, IVs, catheters, things like that, um, or versus the thousand of stocking shelves, feeding, walking, cleaning. Everyone's going to start there, so I'm certainly not putting down those responsibilities, but it also isn't giving you as much time with veterinarians. Um, and the same thing is true of research as well. So if I ask JJ what kind of research he's doing, he gets really involved in, in um, telling me about his project. We're going to value someone that can say, here's the project I'm doing, here's why we think it's important, here's how we came up with, you know, how we designed this study, um, here are potential implications for it and why I'm interested and wait. That person is going to be deemed more to have better research experience and the other person that says, you know, I take care of the fish colony and I make sure that the beakers are in place and one may be a step in the door to getting more involved, but from an hour's perspective, we don't really care. <laughs> what you're doing, how that translates into um, essays and into interviews is important. Um, also at Tufts, you're never going to have to choose what it is you want to do and commit to only that, we're going to give you a lot of opportunity for exploration. So the person that has kind of ventured out and has good depth in one area but has explored some others is going to best take advantage of those opportunities. So as far as experience type questions, if we stay on that track, <coughs> are there other t experience related questions? Okay. Yeah. You mentioned logging your hours. How are you supposed to do that exactly? We want to know about anything and everything. 
an application is not a time to be modest. If you don't tell us about it, we can't know about it. Um, that means tell us what you're doing in high school. Tell us uh, the volunteer opportunities. Doesn't matter to us if it's paid or unpaid. It matters to you, but not to us. Um, everything that is related, medical things we want to know about. So again, if you're kind of in between human med and um, veterinary med, and you're doing something like working part time as an EMT, I mean those are skills that we're going to value for sure. If your research doesn't directly involve animals, we still want to know about it, and we're still going to value it. Um, so. Everything. <laughs> we'll decide what's important. Um, go chronologically, and again, if how many of you, whose biggest interest is small animal medicine? Okay, surprisingly small. Um, first opportunity may have been at the clinic where you brought your animals uh, as a kid. Um, it is fine to go back and to the same clinic each year. What we want to see is that the responsibilities that you have when you are a junior in college, you're not the same that you had as a junior in high school. So also on that experience page, potentially let us know about the progression of your responsibilities too. If we see that you're going back there each summer, then it's a good use of your time and you're to, uh, continuing to grow. Please. Um, what's the situation for international students admission? Okay, so we look at international students just as we look at uh, out-of-state students. So it would be one of uh, or you, yeah, you would be part of that 70% out-of-state. Um, certainly it's not detrimental in any way. Uh, potentially adds to some diversity. Um, within our current incoming class, or not incoming class, I guess I've just started, so. Our current first year class, we have a student from Japan, a student from Taiwan, a student from India, and a student, students are students that have gone to U.S. schools for, for undergrad, and that seems like probably what you're doing as well. Um, otherwise, International students tend to just go directly um, to their their home schools because the uh, biggest reason is they can do it four years earlier because it's you know part of their their college process. Um, so we don't get too many that have done undergrad other elsewhere, but um, just uh, also you wouldn't have to do the TOEFL or any sort of English um, exam because you've taken all your coursework in. Mm -hmm. in English-based curriculum. So it would be the same process for you as anyone else, except for something like financial aid, um, which if it was, wasn't bleak enough, <laughs> um, is that much more challenging? Uh, but I can't answer too many questions on financial aid, because it's just not my area. Yeah, Jake. Uh, um, first thing I want to say is thank you for so much for coming by here, um, giving awesome answers. And um, um, second thing, um, so, um, in your capacity, do you sometimes have interviews with people? Um, sure. And um, I mean, obviously, I can't ask about like certain questions you would ask somebody. But was there ever an impressive answer that you got? I'll be as transparent as I can about interviews. Um, so for the master's programs, there is not an interview process. So if anyone's interested in the master's program, you don't have to interview. But if you want to come in and have a conversation with one of the directors of the program, you are welcome to. Um, to just see how good of a fit are you for the program and is the program for you. Um, for the DVM program, anyone that we want to continue to pursue the candidacy of will come in for an interview. It is typically a 35 to 45 minute conversation. It is very conversational. Um, after our interviews, we, so we uh, send out through email a follow-up survey. What do you think of this? How can we improve this? And it's actually, we actually take that into account and I think our interview days are better now than they were five years ago because we've gotten good feedback. Um, but on interview day, we have a faculty panel where you get to hear from some of our um, great faculty members some of the interesting projects that they're doing and ways in which our students are getting involved. It's also a way where you don't just walk into the campus and have an interview and you know it kind of relaxes you a little bit, familiarizes you better with the school, um, sets a nice tone for the day. We'll have financial aid sessions important, but typically not someone's favorite part of the day. <laughs> Tours of the campus led by students. Um, at lunch, our current students are joining um, for lunch so that you can just chat with them very informally. For lunch, we usually have it catered by Chipotle. People seem to like that. Um, but the overall favorite part of the day has most often been cited as being the interview itself, which is kind of wonderful. Um, you will meet with two faculty members. Hopefully, one of the two, at least, will share a similar interest with you. 
we try to do that if we can. It just makes the conversation uh, a little bit more organic. Um, also, realistically, if you come in for an interview, we like you. And if we like you, we want you to come to the program. So, in one regard, it's a way for them to kind of gauge the level at which you've been working. And you know, the more issues and insights that you provide, the more maturity you show, the, the greater sense of the profession, the better. Um, but it's also a, an opportunity for you, because it is a conversation, to come in with questions, to hear from someone that's potentially working in a field that you're very interested in, and to kind of get an idea of how can I get more involved with you, or what do students like me do during their selective time, or um, during their elective time, during fourth year, or summer research, or just as graduates. Um, and, you know, get a feel for, is Tufts the right school for you? They've read your application in advance, and I think that's huge because you do not have to win them over or start from the beginning when in your application, and this is why maybe it's beneficial to contact me at some point and talk about essays, um, there are opportunities for you in the application itself to add new areas of insight and show some depth and you know, let us know what you're excited about and basically yell at your interviewers, ask me about this. If this is, this is where we should pick up from and if this comes up in the interview, I would love it, um, and I can really present myself very well. There is not a set of typical questions that gets asked. Um, Sometimes, you know, it depends on what you're interested in. If you're interested in something like shelter medicine, perhaps something like, uh, you know, some of those difficult conversations or financial limitations of either your clinic or your, uh, you know, the owners are, that you're working with are going to be issues. Um, if it's another area like research, you know, how do you feel about, you know, different areas there? Um, just depends on where you've shown areas of interest. There is not, they're not trying to trip you up. Um, and I think that might be the most difficult thing about our interview is no one leaves there thinking, oh my god, I bombed it. There isn't going to be the question that everyone gets asked where you go, what did that even mean? Um, so if someone doesn't do well, they typically don't recognize that right away, um, which is why also if you're on a wait list or you get denied, contact me because I can give you feedback about your interview, about your essays, about your letters of evaluation, whatever. Um, but the overall thing that they're looking for, recognition of the profession, overall maturity. And also the interview is not 100% of the decision, it just becomes a piece of the decision. Academics will always be the biggest piece. Um, um, I have another question about, has anyone ever tried reapplying? Yeah, a school? lot of people get into our uh, class on their second or third attempt. It is never detrimental to be a reapplicant. All we want to do is go, where were you last year? Where are you this year? And when you are making strides in your application, your application itself and your candidacy will be better as a result. But on top of that, we can go, Within a year, could they have done more? And when the answer is no, we want to try to reward people for that too. Because you know, your GPA is going to kind of stay the same, and it's going to be hard to really boost it. But if you're going and you're retaking courses and you're taking additional courses, even if it isn't tremendously reflected in the GPA, we're going to see the commitment from you. And you're going to be that much more prepared and have that much better a time transitioning. If it was a experience question of, I'm not sure this person has enough exposure um, to really understand what this is, let's see what they present next year. Um, then, you know, I think an important aspect is an awareness of where you might be lacking and just continuing to develop it. It's that much more challenging for anyone that applies after they graduate from their undergrad, just because you're not naturally improving your application by taking courses if you don't know to. Um, but never never a problem to be a reapplicant. Um, the person that's now one of the uh, V16, so one of our fourth years, that got in on his third attempt, ended up leading his class in the first year in GPA. Um, it's a guessing game for us. You've got to make us feel as confident as possible that you're going to transition well. But to his credit as well, within those three years, he also earned a master's in anatomy, which made him that much more able to transition and to showcase his ability. So. He helped himself both from the application end, but also from the transition end. Um, so, biggest piece is contact us. I'll give you an idea of 
what could be worked on. And then, uh, again, if you do it in March, it gives you seven months or whatever, versus if you do it in September, it can go, you know, fix your essays this way, but you're not going to make a, a bigger impact than that, really. Um, when it comes to GPA, what's the average GPA? Our average GPA coming in is a 365. Um, that being said, we talk about every person that applies, and my job, if I'm reading your application, is to basically create a narrative for you. This person is a 3-2 student, but here's the story behind it. Here's what they were doing um, at the same time. Here's the trend in their grades. Maybe it's more fair to think of them as a 3-7 student because over the last two years, here's how things have gone. Um, so we tell the story of overall on paper, they are what they look like, or here's why they're not. Here's with that, here's why I'm more confident or why I'm less confident. So we'll pay attention to where did you take your classes? How many classes at a time were you taking? What do your letters of evaluation have to say? What kind of additional classes beyond the prereqs are you doing? Um, so you look for like more, technically speaking, like well-rounded students as opposed to like just we said, we want the 3-9 student, you know, but um, at the same time, we're also going to be able to talk about you and go, well, here's why we think that you today could come into the program and do well. So, um, no level of experience is going to make up for lower academics, um, or no amount of, you know, community service or this or that. Um, the no first question is, can this person come into the program and four years later earn their, their degree? But the GPA isn't the only thing to consider as part of that. Um, the GRE is part of that academic picture as well. All right. Yeah. Um, how is your support once you get in? Like, is there lots sure, of sure. Uh, sections and stuff like that? So if anyone grabbed one of these sheets, um, it says, Class size 95. What that means is 95 people, and if you didn't, then they'll be around. But it, said, it says class size 95. We try to make the class size of 98. So if you see 95, that means that those are 95 new students. Um, meaning that three people, either for sometimes it's personal or health reasons, and sometimes it's academic reasons. But it basically means three people that were part of the V18 class did not go on to second year. Um, and maybe they had to repeat the year and they found that out towards the end when their grades really dipped all of a sudden, you know, and just kind of tanked. Or maybe there's someone that took a leave, either academic or health, in November and said, okay, I'll see you guys next fall. Um, so basically, 95 out of 98 students went on the second year, and it is a medical program, so it's going to be elevated from what anyone has done. Our best, our job is to go from here, who hasn't given us reason to worry? Realistically, veterinary school is going to be the hardest program that anyone's been a part of before they come in, unless they've already uh, earned a doctorate elsewhere or come in with a law degree or something like that. A couple students uh, will come in with, with those kind of backgrounds. When you're in, um, even from just a, hey, this is kind of a nice pleasantry, um, when you come in, you get paired with a current second year student that can say, just welcome, any questions you have, feel free to ask me, here's where you buy your scrubs. Here's you know different hiking trails in the area you know just overall it's nice to get connected to someone. So uh, this year V18 and V19 got together and went uh, to do karaoke in the first week just again to just kind of get to know one another. Um, it's a very non-competitive environment so I think the class itself helps one another as far as support. If someone makes a very elaborate study guide, they put it on their Facebook page for everyone else. Because if theoretically everyone gets an A, everyone gets an A. It just doesn't happen that way. There's no grade curve, though. Um, so once you're in, you're in, and it's very bonding <laughs> in that it's, it's really stressful and really difficult. So people want to help one another out. If you are starting to slip, we typically, you can expect to have one exam a week um, as part of our DBM program. So you're studying for four classes and keeping up with that while also preparing for an exam in the fifth is you, you know, pretty much what you should expect. So we have maybe three, four, five exams for every class. So if the first one doesn't go well, there's time to make it up. If you're starting to slip, academic affairs is certainly going to um, want to talk to you and just kind of create a plan. Um, every class has student advisors for that class. So each particular class, like 
biochemistry and anatomy in so that they can go, hey, I think that uh, I think that we really are grasping this, we're ready to move on, or there were a lot of questions about this, can we move back on to that and kind of clear those things up. Also, for every first year class, this is second year, that makes themselves available for tutoring once a week. So we do a lot to try to make sure that those that come into our program are going to graduate. Realistically, a couple people will get lost on the way um, just because it's going to be elevated. But it is a, a uh, big concern of ours to make sure that our students come into the program and do well. So there was also a question on our large animal hospital opportunities. Um, so first of all, again, at no point do you ever have to say, here's what I want to do, and commit to only that. Um, so if you come in with an existing interest, great. What we are not a good school for, though, is if you come in saying, I've worked with horses at veterinary school, I only want to learn about horses, and when I graduate, I want to be an equine practitioner. If you are coming in with blinders going, here's why I'm going to vet school, and here's the profession, you know, the area of the profession that I'm working in, and I don't want content in the other areas, a track program is going to be much better for you. Tufts is non-track, meaning we're going to expose you to a whole lot. We'll give you some opportunities to continue to explore that area of interest. But that person that I just described is going to hear about some of our classes like public health, international vet medicine, zoo medicine, pathology, um, human animal relations, ethics, business. And they're going to go, I don't want to get content on things like exotics and zoo med. And, and other people are going to go, huh, public health, I'd love to hear how I could combine my what I'm doing uh, in small animal with public health concerns. And so the person that's kind of ready to, isn't ready to choose just one, or wants to hear about some other opportunities within the profession, is going to do very well in our program. Um, so minimally, there will be clinical skill, skills starting in your first year where you work on our campus farm. Um, and that will include working with horses, cattle, swine, sheep, uh, chickens. Um, we have a couple alpacas, but those are mainly used for research. Um, there will certainly be anatomy um, of large animal, so equine. Um, you could join, don't, starting in your first semester, first year, you can join something like large animal tech team and create, get amazing exposure. That's the cell. The realistic is, don't start it first semester, first year. <laughs> um, how, it is an amazing way to make connections with the faculty members that are working in the hospitals, to get terrific hands-on experience, to get a sense of what our large animal vet's doing and is this an area I'm interested in, and to get aid. Um, all those things are amazing. Veterinary school, as I just said, is really difficult. Give yourself at least a semester to figure out, can I take on more? Um, because if a horse is colicking, you're getting called in at 1 in the morning, and you're going to be there until 5 or 6. Um, and as I said, minimally it's going to affect your, your sleep, but potentially coincide with that exam that you have. Um, it's good to find out, are you the student that can take on 5 or 8 hours of something, or are you the student that just goes, no, being a, being a vet is my full-time, or a vet student is my full-time job. Because uh, though the getting paid is nice, realistically, it's not making a huge <laughs> contribution to, to that bill. Um, on top of that, we also have something called selectives. And so this goes beyond just a large animal question. Selectives are what you want them to be. For the most part, you go to class with the other 98 students that are part of your class. Selectives are the time for you where we go, for the first two years of our pr program, you will never have class from 1 to 5 on a Tuesday. That selective time, if it fits neatly there because you're doing something in our hospitals, terrific. If it doesn't, let's say some of our students uh, go and work at Mystic Aquarium. It doesn't fit neatly in 1 to 5 on Tuesday. So they go, okay, a big chunk of my Saturday is going to be devoted to, to working at Mystic Aquarium, so I need to make sure I'm studying during this you know, available time. Um, but basically, 40 hours a semester that you need to fill doing something. How you do that is entirely up to you. One of the things that I had mentioned is that we have a very one health mentality. So um, all you have to do is go, here's how it's vaguely related to veterinary medicine. So if it's research, if it's human medicine, if it's environmental studies, um, shelter med, aquatics, zoo, surgeries, whatever. Um, some things are going to be more hands-on than others, but they do not need to be done on campus. Um, some people are going to be first and second years that have spent a ton of time in our small animal hospital or a large animal hospital. 
because of their selectives that they've chosen. Others are going to spend no time there in their first or second year and will wait until third year when they're doing their stays and getting involved in other things. So it's either a way to come in with an interest like large animal and go, let me get a whole lot more than what everyone else is doing, or to go, gee, I hadn't really done much with wildlife. I kind of like the idea, but let me try it out. So there's employment opportunities. There's the opportunities within the curriculum. We also have a large animal hospital on campus, case load around 1,600 or so. About 50% of that is um, equine sports medicine. Um, so that could be something to continue to get involved in as well. Minimally, you will spend time there doing rotations um, in your fourth year with large animal medicine, large animal surgery, cardio, dermatology potentially works in there, opto potentially works in there. Um, that's kind of a nice part of having all the hospitals in the same place is that when you're on something like ophthalmology, you might work in wildlife, you might work in large animal, and you might work in small animal. Depends on the day. Could yeah. you explain about your Tufts Tech course? Yeah. Um, so Tufts Tech is wonderful if really interested in shelter medicine, small animal medicine, um, just trying to get more responsibilities a, a bit sooner. What Tufts Tech is, is at Worcester Technical High School, they now have a clinic that's attached to the high school. And um, it's something we started about three or four years ago. It's a mandatory three-week rotation in your fourth year. And it is tremendously beneficial um, to our students in that the clinic works with low-income families in the Worcester area. They offer care at about one-fifth the price in national averages. And the way that they do that is that the high school students are basically learning how to become pet techs. And our students are taking on the role pretty much a practitioner. There are two veterinarians that just work there. Um, otherwise, you have your students cycling in for three-week shifts. And while there, they're going to do what they do at, the, uh, at our campus, doing things like examinations and uh, you know, helping with um, follow-ups and lab work and stuff like that. But also, they potentially can get really involved. Um, they might be able to be doing surgeries, some of the more basic, like dentals and spays and neuters. But our students also can potentially be doing things like eye nucleation, limb amputations, ACL repair surgeries. Um, so that a student might do 80% of a limb amputation themselves, and the veterinarian assist them with the other 20% or so. Um, that's the way that they keep the cost low, is that the veterinarian is the overseeing vet that just makes sure everything's going well, but really it's a tremendous amount of responsibilities and the closest to what the students are doing, um, or closest to what they will be doing in practice once they graduate. So it is the most commonly revisited um, rotation because students just want to get as many cases as possible. Um, so it's a great way to help the community. Also, just realistically, demographically, is going to be a different demographic than those that can afford the care at, at our small animal hospital. Um, so it also, again, allows you to, to be working with a different group of people in which either perhaps um, education as far as the care of their animals is not going to be as well developed, or perhaps language barriers, or more financial restraints, or things like that. So it, it's great exposure that way, too. And you don't have to wait until fourth year to get involved. So there are first and second years that will spend some of their selective time at Tufts of Tech if they've chosen that as their selective. Basically what we do for selectives is we go, here are the 10 most commonly chosen, just to let you know that they're there. Otherwise, whatever you want it to be, all you need is a mentor to, to take you on, and it's great, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, five five-on-one type scenario. So Tufts of Tech would likely be kind of a, a five-on-one during selective time. Um, but would get you uh, that exposure very early on in the curriculum. Anything else that you yeah, please? Um, could you talk more about like the prereqs needed for that school? And is there any particular one that you're um, that well, you worry about? I'm guessing like the English portion and like um, are any of them covered by APs that you take in high school, or do you have to do it all again? If you took an AP course and it's on your college transcript, we will accept that to meet one of our prerequisites. So if it's AP English, it's very easy. Um, if something is writing intensive and one of your schools has a, is denotes on the, on the uh, transcript that it was writing intensive, we will accept that as one of our English courses. Um, to answer the question more generally, not every veterinary school is going to have the same 
um, prerequisite. So that's also why it's good to kind of prioritize what are your top choices and just make sure you prepare for those top four or five um, so that nothing surprises you. We don't require animal nutrition. Some schools do. You guys aren't going to find it at the schools that you're currently attending. Um, you are at no detriment if you do not have an animal science major <laughs> at your programs. Bio is by far our most common major coming in. Um, if given the choice between animal nutrition or something like anatomy, physiology, toxicology, histology, we want you to take those upper level sciences because you're going to encounter them <laughs> during your first and second year. So we want you to have a really strong foundation. Animal content is huge in your third year veterinary school, animal related or specific courses in your programs. Um, but again, some schools might need animal nutrition. If they do and it's one of your top choices, you just take it online. You know, um, Purdue, Oklahoma State are the most common places to take them online. Microbiology, if you're part of a bio major, you're probably going to encounter, but if you're not in a bio major, you just gotta know to take it. Um, not a prereq of Tufts either, but again, it's out there. Public speaking is one that you're not just going to naturally encounter, but a couple schools need that. If you're not sure if something fulfills a prerequisite, like a social science or a humanities or something like that, just send me an email with a course description, and I'll let you know whether or not it's been approved. And if it has been approved, actually, regardless whether we say yes or no, we will keep a log of that, so that even if you know, you're applying three years later, we'll know, OK, we said that linguistics uh, would count as your uh, social science, even though we traditionally think of it as being a humanities. We're going to go here and then here. Um, I read something about that, but I'm not sure. Uh, can I, as an undergraduate in my third or fourth year, take classes at Tufts? No. Um, not at the veterinary school. Yeah. Um, there are some courses that are open for just public, you know, where you can look and see some of the content of some of our, our veterinary courses. Mm -hmm. um, and I will also make this offer to any of you. If you send me an email with some areas of interest and some potential dates or times that might work for you. If you'd like to come to our campus and sit in on the class just to get a feel for you know what to expect, I'm happy to set that up for you. But as far as being able to kind of enroll um, within one of those courses or audit or what, unfortunately now you're not able to. Okay. Yes. Oh, just going back to the classes again. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if like AP Lit would count towards? Um, like, do you need two semesters of English or you do. just one? So, so would that just count as one semester? Yeah. That actually counts towards. Okay. And I guess it depends on how many credits you receive from the school. If the yeah, school gave you so. eight credits, then we would go, okay, you fulfilled it. But if it only met one requirement, yeah. then you would need one more. Okay, thanks. If you are shy of one prerequisite when you apply and you plan on taking it over the summer or something, what Not a problem. Okay. So let's say you're applying during your senior year of college. You will have your fall, your spring, and your summer. All we care about is that you have a plan to meet those requirements by the time you come in as an uh, enrolling student. Um, and as far as science is, you know, if anyone got started on this kind of late, you just need to have enough done for us to make an educated decision on how you might do. So if, you, you know, if you're still missing physics 2 and biochem, that's not a reason to delay it if uh, what works better for you is to um, is to apply that year, and you know, worst case scenario is uh, we go, well, there are a few too many question marks. Um, you can at least you know apply and get feedback, and then just reapply the next year. Um, some people tell me, you know, I'm not sure if I want to apply this year or next year. I, I don't know. What do you think? I go, if you're willing to wait a year, you might as well apply this year. So you see if you get in, <laughs> and if if you don't, then you know, not a big deal because you were thinking about waiting a year anyway. <laughs> so all that kind of falls into that. Uh, when's a good time to take the GRE? Overall, the answer is whenever you think that you have time. Um, time to study and time where you're not balancing a 40-hour class schedule and also work or clubs or whatever it is that you're doing. If that means a winter break, great. Um, I would say that the latest to maybe do it is I always encourage people to try to take it by early July before they're going to apply. And a, the application deadline is September 15th. So what that does is allows you to, uh, to study again if you need to. Because we'll take your highest scores in either section, and if the verbal doesn't go the way you wanted it to, we use your quantitative from the first one, and we go, okay, commit 20% of your time to maintain, 
commit 80% of your time to, uh, to increase the verbal. Um, so anyone that I talk to in one of those sessions where it's, you know, August 30th, and they go, hey, I'm taking my, uh, my GRE next week, I go, okay, but that's your score. So hopefully things go well, hopefully you've been studying. Um, the biggest difference between scores is not necessarily I used this review program versus this one, it's usually I made sure that the GRE was the primary thing I was doing, um, and I gave myself time. They're, they last up to five years, so if that means you do it during your junior year, then fine. Yeah. It's kind of an advanced, but do you have any um, like programs that uh, help with students who are interested in like specializing in a certain area after that school? We do. We have, we have career services um, where you can sit down in a one-on-one -on -one with one of our uh, with one of our veterinarians. Um, first of all, I think any faculty member would be happy to be a mentor for you, just in general, if you express interest in there. So anyone that says, hey, I think I'm interested in exotics or neuro, or <coughs> you have a conversation with them, I guarantee the response is going to be, hey, come on in when you can, and just get a better feel for it. Um, but beyond that, yeah, we have career services that helps with that. And if you're thinking about doing a specialty and doing an internship or residency with that, uh, we are about 20 percentage points higher than the national average of how veterinary schools do placing students. So we're usually within the top three. If you spend that much time, money, and effort, it's nice to know there's a place where you go with it, and we do very well with that. Um, about 50 to 55 percent of our, our students will uh, pretty much immediately join an internship or a residency. Just I think mostly because they've had the exposure early on of, uh, is this what I want to do? And if it is, um, they typically will have good letters as well because you know they're just going to be that much more familiar. Yeah. To what extent is an advantage to apply early? Early in what regard? In the application cycle. Oh, okay. We do not have rolling admissions, so whenever your application is ready and you feel comfortable about it, send it in to just reduce your stress. Um, but there is no advantage to. Uh, to applying July 1st versus September 15th. So it's now been three weeks since the application deadline, and I haven't read a single application. They're not ready to be read, and FemCast is still confirming and verifying and whatever it is that they do. So first year again being on it. So hopefully this comes soon because, as I said to you, we last year on the sheet you see we had about 670 applications. This year we had 1,015. That's uh, that's what FemCast means for us. <laughs> Um, but it's also why sign into this sign-in sheet <laughs> in the situation where it's you and someone else and you both have the same credentials and I mean at some point right it has to be one person or the other yeah um, as far as who gets the interview or there is a slight advantage <laughs> or I, I think it's going to become that much more of an advantage to show continued interest in Tufts um, by coming here today, we know you're that much more likely to apply to the program or to um, accept your interview or accept your offer. It shows that you have a greater knowledge and you didn't just check a box because this year you could and last year you couldn't. Um, so, um, those things matter too. <laughs> but um, as far as when applying, whenever you're ready. Just to follow up to what you just said, <clears throat> are there any opportunities for pre vet students to spend? Time at Tufts. There to, are yeah. to learn more about Tufts. Sure. To get to know, get allow you folks to know them. Okay, so one, uh, the appointments that you can schedule with me is one good way to do it. Um, potentially sitting on a class, as I mentioned, is another good way to kind of learn more about Tufts. Um, are any of you from WPI? So um, when you were doing your MQPs or things like that, <laughs> there are some uh, have been instances in which WPI students have done their projects with. Uh, with Tufts faculty members. Um, I would say probably our star of the equine department is currently in her second year, uh, has been working with them since her junior year of college um, from WPI. Uh, I don't know if, if you've heard the name Brenna uh, Puglisi. Yeah. Um, Brenna is someone that made it, did her, her project with our large animal um, clinic um, and got so involved through things like um, the large animal tech team and selectives and she decided, here's what I really want to do. So she took a year off in between first and second year and earned her master's in comparative biomedical sciences, which basically meant for one year she was going to every appointment 
with Dr. Kirkerhead, our um, orthopedic surgeon. So amazing, you know, experience that she's going to get an amazing letter one day. Um, but on top of that, uh, I've just been able to, you know, really just build off that. We're going to do continued exploration. For her, it's been more, here's what I'm most interested in, so let me get as involved. But um, a lot of people get involved in our wildlife clinic. There, so um, those of you that said that you're fairly local, you can work at our wildlife clinic. We take about six undergrads every summer to work work at the clinic. Um, it is a volunteer opportunity, unfortunately, versus paid. But it's hard to find wildlife exposure. So if that's an area of interest, please do. Um, I, you know, I, I think that those are probably the best ways. Potentially getting involved in research. I want to be realistic now and go. The priority goes first to our fourth year students, then to our underclassmen, then to students that say. Uh, how can I get involved, you know, as a prospective student? So uh, that's what to expect. But in the past, there have certainly been a lot of students that, that have been working in our clinics. If it's small and only most interested in, again, I'm going to be as realistic as possible and go, you're better off doing it at a different clinic because with that chain <laughs> of, uh, of command there, uh, at, our, at our small animal hospital, it's going to be mostly cleaning and uh, you know, walking animals and things like that, and you're going to be able to have more progression elsewhere. So um, thanks for coming out. I'll make myself available, myself available. If, uh, if you have any questions that you felt like were more individualized that you know, I didn't think everyone needed to know. Otherwise, though, um, March, to March to September for those um, respective appointments. I uh, wish I can provide feedback, but even in the meantime, if you have a quick question, send me an email. Um, I'm going to respond to it within a couple days. Um, our pet admissions email also will work, but sometimes they'll just go to me anyway. So it's going to be a little bit quicker if you just talk to me directly. Um, and if I can provide, you know, if you are most interested in something like large animal medicine or neuro or uh, wildlife or something like that, or want to know more about a master's in public health, Whatever it is, my job is to go, here's why it's great. Realistically, I'm also going to go, here's the contact info of one of our students that's doing it, and they're going to say, here's what's tough about it. Here's how I want to integrate it into uh, my career. Here's the things that I love. Here are the things that could be improved about the program. So getting a student perspective, I always think, is really beneficial. Let me know. All right, so thanks, guys. And we're out in time for everyone to see Survivor tonight. Thank you for it. Yeah.